it dawned on me that the last line of the chorus might just be something I want on my tombstone. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Oh, I love amen. I mean, that's going to come for us one day. Amen. amen. We're going to be there with him, and there will be no more cares. There will be no more cars breaking down. There will be no more bills to pay. Amen. There will be no more guilt. There will be no more sadness, no more loss of, of loved ones. Everything that, that we have that we suffer in now will be over with. <clears throat> I seem to be singing a lot of songs about what's going to be like over there this morning. That seems to be what the theme is, isn't it? On the resurrection morning on the dead time mistake people of this world make is thinking that they need to be happy here. Thinking that you're supposed to be happy here. Thinking that this life is wonderful. You're supposed to have a great life here because that's all there is. And if you have that mentality, you'll go through life pursuing happiness and forget that the real happiness we have is coming, isn't it? Amen. And if we seek everything down here to make us happy, we're, we're missing out on the eternal things. Amen. <clears throat> I wanted to do a new song every week, and I've added this one this week. Maybe you've not heard it, but it's an old Southern Gospel song. So just listen to the first verse, and you can pick up on it. You might have heard the chorus before. <clears throat> oh, what glory awaits me in heaven's bright city when I get there such sights I'll be
walking through the woods yesterday, and I haven't heard this song in probably 30 years, and it came to mind. I started singing it, walking through the woods, and and it, th then I started to cry because I thought so many times when we think about how wonderful heaven's going to be, people say, oh, my mama's there. You know, oh, my daddy's there, my best friend. <laughs> and it's about Jesus. That's right. about Jesus as good as you think it's going to be Jesus is better That's amen right. it's about Jesus <coughs> I'll find the key I can sing this in <coughs> that you be in our service. Help us to focus today, Lord, on Christ. Help us to focus on our Lord and Savior, Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would be in our service today. Meet needs today, Lord, to worship, as we worship you. Minister to those, Lord, who are longing for you and for a touch from you. Lord, speak to those who need direction and need to hear your voice. Lord, give us what we need in our spirits as you've given us in our bodies. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you can be seated.
<clears throat> Who's going to take up our offering this morning? We're going to start it around over, so James will start today. Okay, James, if you'll get prepared for that. And then we'll have prayer needs lifted up. If you have a message, you want a message in, send in your prayer needs. Okay. Ask for prayer for her um, sister-in-law Terry. She is bleeding internally from an operation to remove her gallbladder. It's been months ago. Um, bleeding is believing for healing. So we're just binding with her on that. We need to pray for Camelia. She's been in the hospital for months. Um, Okay. She's finally back online, so I'm just thankful for that. Amen. Lenny Nolan and Pramilia need a prayer for them. Lenny's, it's Lenny's sister-in-law, Terry. Okay, Lenny's sister-in-law, healing from problems after surgery. And Pramilia's been in the hospital, but she's home and recovering slowly. Please remember them. Anyone else? Ben has one. Yeah. Um, my teacher's having a baby, and I hope it goes well. Your teacher's having a what? A baby, and I hope it goes well. Having a baby. Well, she certainly needs prayer, doesn't she? What's her name? Miss Sasser. Okay. We'll pray for her. Ben's teacher's having a baby. Anyone else? Suzanne Chanis. A lot of people in pain. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll receive our offering. Lord, we come before you today, Lord, lifting up these needs, asking, Lord, that you touch and healing these that are sick, these that are suffering. Lord, sometimes it's just the ailments of this body. We ask, Lord, that you just touch us and Lord, and touch these needs as we've been lifted up. And Father, heal this one that's suffering, Lord, from uh, problems after surgery. Um, Lord, just this time of the year, the weather changes. Some people have, have the uh, arthritis and uh, fibromyalgia and problems that are, we're suffering in our bodies. Lord, we ask that you touch Miss Suzanne and Pramila. We ask that you uh, give her healing, Lord, that you would let her recover. Lord, we pray for this teacher that's having the baby, and we ask, Lord, that you would uh, give her a, a touch all through the pregnancy, touch the baby, and let this baby be formed perfectly. We ask, Lord, that you would provide for this family. And, Lord, I just ask that you be in our service and have your way and let your will be done today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, Mr. Mark Ramsey had Mark. surgery. Mark okay. Ramsey, um, a spinal, uh, some kind of surgery on the spine. Okay. And he's going to be out of work, I think, for 10 weeks is what Christy said. Okay. And then also um, they diagnosed Lily May this week, or Sam's grandmother with COVID at the nursing home. Mm -hmm who is supposed to only be there for temporary rehab. Okay. And now she's been put in quarantine for 10 days. She didn't even know she was sick. So there's a lot of weirdness there. But um, God is in control, and we just need to keep her in prayers for her spirit because now her son can't even come in there and see her. She mm. can have no visitors. Okay. So that's not pleasant. Okay. Lily May and Mark Ramsey, remember them in prayer? Oh, and did you already say Miss Nikki? No. Miss Nikki O'Neill's family is, is fighting COVID too. Nikki O'Neill. COVID. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to lift up my supervisor, Bob. He is, his, He and his family have 
have COVID. You reminded me of it when you said those. Okay, we'll remember those this week, please, in your prayers. Okay, James, everybody ready? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Amen. <coughs> Thank you for your attendance this morning. Thank you for your prayer. And we are going to pick back up. Seems like it's been a while since we jumped on these. I think I did one between the holidays. Um, we're doing the series on um, the fruit of the Spirit. And we're up to meekness, meekness today. So let's go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5, if you will. <clears throat> Galatians 5. And we'll go through our target scripture. Y'all can probably quote it <clears throat> by now. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Does everybody read it with me? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So we have gone through all of these things. Can anybody testify? I've not we've got one more next time, but can anybody testify that something that you've learned from these studies? Anybody learned anything that you remember looking back on these studies? You can't you can't pick which one that you want. So what? You can't pick the, which one. You that can't you pick. Want. That's good, Ben. Thank you. You can't pick the ones you want. You can't just have a fruit that you like. It's it's called fruit of the spirit because it's all inclusive. It's not plural. It is singular. Pl fruit of the spirit. Very good, Ben. It's, it's not like you can take one of these that you like and say, well, I don't really like long-suffering because that involves patience and that makes it hard on me, but I like peace, right? So that's good. We, we need to look at these that these are not things fruit for our own consuming pleasure, right? These are not fruit that we eat or we consume or we get spiritual food from. These are fruit that we produce to feed people in the world and to feed people and draw them to Christ, right? It's not God, God gives you peace so that you can enjoy life better. He gives you peace so you can share the Prince of Peace. Amen? He wants, you, he wants your life to be a fruit stand so that people come up and they look at all this fruit and they say, wow, I don't know who this grower is, but I'm really interested in who can grow all this fruit. And you say, well, I can point you to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit because that's how the fruit got here, right? So I want you to think about these fruit, all of these fruit, as something that you have in your life that ministers to people. <clears throat> and meekness is, is very much that way. And we got up to meekness, the, uh, the Greek word, <coughs> excuse me, praotes, praotes is the Greek word, and it means gentleness, mildness, and meekness. Gentleness, mildness, and meekness. Now, the latest trend in society is for women, oh, excuse me, for men, instead of being manly, for men to be effeminate and for women to be tough. That's the latest trend and the latest lie from hell is that women should be really bad and men should be very gentle and kind and play down your manliness. And that is not the way God made us. Men, on the other hand, 
used to look at this word meekness and meek and see it as a negative thing, see it as something that they didn't want to have in their life. Well, I don't want to be come across as a meek person. You know, that is, does not imply weakness. It does not imply um, someone who is uh, uh, afraid of things, someone who is um, a sissy. It implies someone who is under control. Under control. And I want you to look at meekness today with this, this term, power under control. Power under control. I want you to think about having power, but controlling it. Now, as a teenage boy, I needed to get attention, to draw attention to myself. And back then, all the cars had enough power that, that, that you could uh, punch the gas and burn the tires, right? Everybody remember the muscle cars and all that. And I drove a Mustang, and I could... I could really bark the tires as I was coming out of school, and everybody would look at me and go, ooh. And I really thought that was something. And then later I learned that I had to pay for those tires, right? <laughs> later I learned that, you know, getting the, burning the tread off your tires ended up with having to buy new tires. And I was a little more careful. And as I matured, I got where I quit doing uh, what they used to say, jackrabbit starts and, and uh, driving um, aggressively and I drive like an old man now you know I mean I've learned and I used to wonder why these old people drive like this they're under control aren't they they have everything under control why do they go through this curve so slow well maybe he saw somebody get killed on this curve you know so you learn things as you mature you learn to keep things under control and as we look at this today we want to see that the man of God, the woman of God, is a meek person. A meek person. <clears throat> now, we, Angie and I have discussed this many times. When people uh, are able to comment on social media, or um, and I remember back when the term road rage came around, people felt like they were immune to anything if they um, waved part of their finger at you in the car, blew their horn at you, pull right up to you and, and growl or yell at something out the window, and they felt like that they were absolutely had a bubble around them of protection. And then people began to carry guns in cars and they'd shoot each other. And all that aggressiveness that came around um, is just getting worse, which is kind of odd seeing the trend of society. But when we look at this, we as Christians have to be in control of everything. We might have the ability to say something, as you're going to see in Scripture, that's not necessarily something we have to do, is it? And in, and in our um, passage in Colossians 3.12, when Paul says to put on this and this and this, meekness is listed. We've been reading that one every week, Colossians 3.12. Meek, put on meekness. So it's something that you put on, isn't it? It's not a state of mind that you're just unworthy. You don't have to go in with an unworthy attitude. You can go in with a humble and meek attitude, can't you? That's right. You can, you can approach people in an approachable way. Yeah. I don't talk about this very often, but when we started dressing plain 20 years ago, one of the things that it did to me was it crucified my flesh so that I didn't feel... I didn't feel all haughty. I used to wear very expensive ties and nice, and nice clothes, very uh, expensive suits. And I used to uh, really like to wear nice things. And I would go into places, and I could tell the, the before and after. I could tell that people had been intimidated a lot of times by me. When you walk in and you look like you're very wealthy, and you, look, you walk in and you talk to somebody, you can tell... The, the before and the after, if you're approachable or not. Did you know that? You can tell if you go in with somebody and they're, and they're wanting to, oh, I, who is this guy? It makes a difference how you, your attitude, how you approach people. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 5. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5.
I don't know if you've read the Sermon on the Mount lately, but it's probably a good thing to read on a regular basis. <clears throat> Matthew 5. We're going to start with verse 3. <clears throat> and we'll just read all the way down to 12. <clears throat> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Excuse me, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so, so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I used to tell people this is the job description of the Christian. This is the list of things that a Christian is. This is the man of God, woman of God description. Blessed are they. When you read these, these are not things that your flesh wants. These are not things that you, in before stage or in the carnal stage, in the stage of wanting things for your flesh, none of these things fit. Particularly, number five, verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. The meek. Look at, look at them again. The poor in spirit, the, those that mourn, the meek, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted for righteousness sake. And blessed are you when men persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. None of that is things that we would want. I mean, does anybody want that? Not in your right mind, not in your old mind, but in your new mind, and you say, this is what my Lord wants. I don't know why there's a thing that, the teaching that going around that Jesus lets you be you. Right? That's, that's a lie. He doesn't want you to be you. That's why He died on the cross. Jesus doesn't let you be you. He doesn't let you do anything you want to as long as you tag His name on there. I see a lot of uh, local companies that put the little fish emblem or they put John 3.16 or something and it'll Joe's Plum and they'll have a little chrome fish or some kind of little em Christian emblem and, they, and they, maybe they go around they give bad service. You, you're going to get bad business or lose business for doing bad service or giving bad prices more so than if you had that fish or not. You know, that, your testimony is going to be, are you meek? Are you poor in spirit? Not if you got the little fish on there or if you tag Jesus' name on there. If you have these things, you won't even have to tell people that you're a Christian. Did you know that? If you have these character characteristics, these attributes about your life, if you're a peacemaker, if you're merciful, if you're poor in spirit, if you're mourn, if you persecuted for righteousness sake, if you have these things, boom, Christian. Sometimes I, I'll <coughs> say things to Angie like, you know, have you ever met this guy? He's a good Christian man. And she said, what makes you think he's a good Christian man? And she makes me think, why did I just say that? I can't say, well, he goes to church or he, you know, says he's a Christian. In my heart, if he's a good Christian man, he has something about his life, some conversation he had with me, something that I saw him do, something that influenced me. What about your life? Are you meek? Do you have meekness in your life? Because that's the one we're looking at today. That's the fruit today I want you to have in your life. That's the fruit that draws people to you, that it makes you approachable, if you'll allow me that. <clears throat> Let's look at Matthew 27. And we're going to start with verse 11. Verse 
Matthew 27, 11 through 14. <clears throat> This is Jesus standing at the trial right before the crucifixion. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they, they witness against thee? And he answered him to, to never a word in so much that the governor marveled greatly. People are sometimes known or famous or infamous because of their much speaking, aren't they? They're sometimes very much in the news, very much in your life, very much in your face because they talk a lot. Jesus was here and did not defend himself. And it actually went along with Isaiah 53, 7, where Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would not open his mouth. And if you look at this in verse 14, it said, He answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now, I, I get the feeling that when Pilate heard all these accusations, they were contradicting each other. You know, a good judge learns how to tell when someone's telling a lie or not. They can tell by, by body language. They can tell by contradicting things. They may start off, well, it was raining one day, and then I got out there, and I was out in my short sleeve shirt, and wait a minute, why was you in your short sleeve shirt if it was raining? And they pick up on lies. And, the, and Pilate heard all these accusations, and he turned to Jesus, and he said, don't you hear what they're saying against you? In other words, I can hear that it's lies. I can hear that something, some of it, this can't all possibly be. And Jesus didn't say anything, and it said, the governor marveled greatly. Now, I have a line here that I wrote down, just a thought. Meekness is not weakness. It is harder to be able to do something or say something and not do it. It takes strength. It takes strength to keep your mouth shut. It takes strength to withhold something that you could put out on somebody, to destroy somebody. Everybody in here has information that could destroy somebody. You all know things that you've kept your mouth shut about. Right? You all have things, knowledge of things, that if you shared it around town, it would, it would destroy somebody. But you choose not to because it's in God's hands, right? Do you think Jesus couldn't have called 10,000 angels like the song says? Actual, I looked that up the other day, an actual le legion of angels. I think he said 12 legions of angels. I think it's literally 72,000 angels. Thousands of angels Jesus could have called. He stood there and said nothing. He stood there and didn't defend himself. Does that mean we shouldn't defend ourselves? No, sometimes you have to be honest with people, but you don't have to open your mouth every time. My mother always raised us that if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. That's probably something a lot of mothers do. It's probably good advice. Sometimes if you can't say something nice, just don't say anything. Right? This is not just about controlling your tongue. This meekness attitude is, I'm not in charge here. God is. Right? You don't have to put on, well, I'm a... I'm a, a child of God. I come boldly to the throne of grace. You can come boldly to the throne of grace because if you recognize your sins, you're going to need that to get into the throne room, right? If you recognize and remember what Jesus did, you will go in and remember that the blood, the blood, the blood is the reason you're able to even go in the throne room. So you can go boldly in. This does not mean you strut around like a peacock down here on this planet. This means you stand in meekness. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Something that Paul said. 
2 Corinthians 10. We're going to begin in verse 1. 2 Corinthians 10, 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and greatness, gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. <coughs> now I have I have three bullet points, if you will, on this top on this passage. Paul talks out, he starts out talking about that he he's beseeching them, he's begging them in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. When you start talking to somebody, when you start discussing something. When you have something that you need to get out in the open, make sure you have the meekness of Christ about you. Right? Remember the time when Jesus had an adulterous woman brought to him and, and all the accusers went away and he said, woman, where are your accusers? And he didn't condemn her, but he said, go and sin no more, right? He had, I mean, of all people that could have called out sin, he, he had it. He could have... Throwing the first stone, right? He's the one that lived a perfect life. He could have said, I can do it, you can do it too. But he didn't. He just calmly rode in the dirt. When they were gone, he looked at her and said, we're your accusers. Look at that meekness. Walk in that. Amen? The second thing I want you to look at, <clears throat> Paul said, verse 3, we do not walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh though for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh when you are walking in meekness you need to remember that we do not deal with things like other people will christians walk they, they walk excuse me we're in the flesh but we don't war after the flesh we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh he's saying that we don't use the same tactics that the world does Correct? Now, you get two people arguing about anything, and people argue about ridiculous things, family fights, arguments between neighbors, arguments at work, um, people getting on each other's nerves, and they start arguing about things. Can you see Christians in the, in the four Gospels doing this? Can you see people doing this that Jesus is not displeased with? Right? When, when uh, in one passage where the disciples are arguing about which one were going to be greatest in Jesus' kingdom, right? You remember that? And Jesus, he didn't hear them, but he knew what they were saying and talking. He always knows what we're thinking, doesn't he? Right? And he, and he really nailed them about it. That we shouldn't think, you know, well, I'm not as good as Paul the Apostle, but I'm better than old Joe over here. I know in heaven I'll be a lot higher up than he will. You know what? I'm, I'm glad to just know I'm going to be getting there. And I hope Joe gets there too. Amen? Amen? Don't have that attitude that you're better than somebody. And don't use the tactics that the world does when you're dealing with battles. <clears throat> because our, <coughs> excuse me, our battles are spiritual battles, aren't they? You don't need to use the, the warfare of this world, the tactics of this world, the arguments of this world to deal with spiritual, with spiritual battles that you're going through. That's ridiculous. You can't use psychology to do it. You can't use the greatest arguments. You can't use all the education and knowledge that you can muster. You can't go away to college and learn all about science and then come back and argue that God is the creator. 
and come back and nail anybody. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to just say what the Word says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and that's what I believe. Period. And look at the um, verse 5. <coughs> <clears throat> casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I just can't stop thinking about that. Yes, you can. I just can't get it off my mind. She said that to me and I just can't stop thinking about it. Yes, you can. You can overcome. Amen? Yes. Bring in, into captivity every thought. I just can't forgive them for that. Yes, you can. I, when I, every time I see them, I just want to say, I just want to slam them. Well, you need to get, that, get over that. You need to get that out of your mind. Because when you see them, you will fail. You will go into that. You need to go ahead and defeat that in your mind before you ever encounter that person. Whatever it takes, you need to do it now. You need to, to win these battles now. And you need to put on meekness, as Colossians said. Put it on. Put on meekness. <clears throat> Let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of, a, of men. And being found... In fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> that is the mind that you're supposed to put on. You're supposed to put on the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, that being humbled, put on the form of a servant. Do you have a servant's attitude? Because that will keep you meek, won't it? It will destroy every bit of pride in, in you when you find out that you're nothing special. When you find out that the things that you thought you specialized in are no longer needed. When, the, when you think that you had some ability that, that trumped everybody else's ability and then you found out that you was nothing more than a big fish in a little pond and you got out and now you're a little fish in a big pond. You thought you was really something in the little creek you was in and then you went out into the, the main area of water and you found out that there was bass out there that was ten times the size of you and you're just a minnow. Right? When you find out who you really are, it will cause a meek attitude. When you find out what Jesus had to do for you on the cross, it will keep you meek. We had communion a couple weeks ago, a week ago, during our... Uh, New Year's Eve celebration. <clears throat> and it says, do this in remembrance of me. Remember the Lord's death. Right? We do that. We do that to keep us in the right posture with God and the right posture with men. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 12. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 12. We looked at Jesus standing before Pilate. We're going to look at Moses. Numbers 12. We're going to read 1 through 15. <clears throat> and Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. 
Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. I want to just stop right there and think about this passage. We're about to see how God deals with this. We're about to see how a man named Moses had married an Ethiopian woman and Miriam and Aaron didn't like it. Now they didn't want to come out and say, well, she's not good enough. We don't think you should have married her. They came out and said, does God only spoke, speak through Moses? Does he not also speak through us? Sometimes people will veil their arguments. They really don't like something about you, but they'll point at something else about you. And in doing so, Moses never answered them. Did you see that? Moses did not answer them. He let God do his bidding. He let God argue for him. He let God do the battle for him. And I think keeping your mouth shut has a lot to do with meekness. He could have come up and said, I am God's prophet. I am God's leader. I am the one that brought us out. I, I, I. But he didn't. He just kept silent. Verse 4, And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, into the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. So here is, here is God himself speaking to these two who have argued they wanted to bring something against Moses. They wanted to bring him down from his position and say, you shouldn't even be here. Well, they didn't say, well, your judgment doesn't look too good because you married this Ethiopian woman. They said, are, are you the only one that hears from God? Don't we hear from God too? Verse 7, my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. Did you hear what God just said? He said, if I wanted to portray something to people and talk to a prophet, I will give it to him in visions and dreams. But my servant Moses is not so. He is faithful in all mine house. With him I will speak mouth to mouth, even apparently and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? He said, I won't give it to him in visions and things that are veiled. I will give it to him directly. I speak plainly to him as a man to a man. I will speak straight to him, mouth to mouth. I will give Moses what he needs to hear because Moses was the friend of God. Did you know that? That's right. That's right. Moses was controlled enough, mature enough, meek enough that he dealt with God on a face-to-face -face level. And when he, when he spoke about his friend Moses, he defended him. My question to you is, will God not defend you? Won't God defend you? Won't the Lord defend you? Do you feel the need to defend yourself or to go in and of some pretense put on what a godly man you are? Right. I'm always leery of people that say, I'm closer to God than I've ever been. That's, that's a pure sign that someone is not doing right. When they tell you, I'm closer to God than I've ever been. Well, Brother Paul, doesn't that sound... Well, I hope we all get closer and closer. That implies that you're, you're so close to God, you don't even need to grow anymore. And the real man and woman of God, instead of saying, I'm as close to God, closer to God than I've ever been, will say, I'm so far from God. I am so far from God. I, I've just looked down this chasm that they call the Grand Canyon. I never knew it was so deep. I can see a little line down there that's blue, and that's the river. That's a massive river at the bottom of this canyon. I never knew it was so deep. When you read in the Word of God, you're going to find out what a sinner you are. You're going to find out why Jesus had to die on the cross for you. When you look in the mirror, as James said, and you, you behold yourself, don't go turning away saying, well, it doesn't mean anything. Deal with it. Amen? Amen.
Verse 9, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed, when she cometh out of her mother's womb. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Wow. This man did not defend himself. He did not stand up and say, You're wrong. I love this woman, and I wanted to marry her. My first wife is gone. I wanted to marry this Ethiopian woman. This woman is a good woman. You shouldn't have said anything against her. He said nothing. And then when God defended him, and, le and she had leprosy on him, he cried, heal her, oh God. Heal her, God. Can you, can you take on that attitude like Colossians says? Can you put that on? Can you put on that meekness where instead of defending yourself to others and feeling like you need to stand up, well, I've just got to say something because I can't stand it anymore. Can you stand there and just be quiet and let God do your battle? Can you take on that heart of Jesus. <clears throat> Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. This is my last passage. 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 through 6. First Peter chapter 3, 1 through 6. <clears throat> Peter writes, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating of hair or of wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection even, excuse me, unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. This passage tells us in verse 1, that if any husband is not uh, not of, of the faith, that they may be won over by the conversation of their wives or the behavior of the wives. And then he gives out the behavior of the wives is not your outward adornment, but is the inner meekness that you have. That meek and quiet spirit in verse 4, which is in the sight of God of great price. And I said that earlier, that you will be much more approachable in the public square, in, in um, ministry, if you will have a meek spirit. Amen? Amen? We know that. We also, in the home front, will have that same kind of influence. Mm -hmm. it, ladies, if you have not put on that meek and quiet spirit, you've lost the power of God. Mm -hmm. Because the power is in that. Amen? Amen? The power is in that meekness. The power is in that quiet spirit that you don't have to stand up and defend yourself. They can watch you quietly go to church while they stay home. Now, Angie and I have discussed this. We've talked about it many times. She's had many women write her about this. I'm following this, and my husband still won't believe. Keep living it. Amen? That's right. It's not something that works overnight. It's not something that's a slap in his face like God coming down and giving Miriam leprosy it's not one of those kind of things jesus went through crucifixion he did not defend himself moses was defended immediately moses had that quietness about him but my guess is there were other people that had attacked him this was just one that came close to home right. ladies when you have this meek and quiet spirit you change your husband 
I know that my wife has changed me. My wife has many times followed this pattern and it's gotten my attention. I'm not talking about whining and crying. I'm not talking about standing up and saying, well, husband, you're just going to have to do this if you're a man of God. Well, husband, if you don't do this for me, then you're not a man of God. I'm not talking about those kind of arguments. My wife has had this meek and quiet spirit about her that has changed my life. And you will change your husbands. If this will work on this kind of level between a husband and wife, what will it do for people outside your home? What will it do for ladies, and not just ladies, but men too, what will it do to have a meek spirit? How will you change your world? Because everybody has a sphere of influence, don't they? Everybody has somebody that you reach. Everybody has somebody that, that needs to see Jesus, and they can see it in you if you have meekness about you. <clears throat> Think about, again, what I said, power under control. Have you ever met someone who was famous, but you didn't know it in the first few minutes of their conversation, and then you realized who they were? In my life, I've had the opportunity of meeting several people, and a lot of them, I didn't know who, who they were. And that's a good thing if you don't know who they were. If someone comes and knocks on this door, and they've got an armed guard around them, that's pretty pretentious, isn't it? That's not meekness, is it? If someone comes up to the door and they're, not, they're just dressed modestly, they come up and knock and they're very polite and talk, they don't talk like they're anybody special, that is meekness. That is meekness. That's right. I remember, um, I don't know why I'm remembering this story, but maybe you need to hear it. Years ago in Birmingham, when I lived down there, um, had a ham radio on and through the day, people would be on the road and they would talk to each other, <coughs> different things. And this man came through. He, and he got on the radio and he was talking. He gave his call sign. And he said, yeah, I've been down in uh, Mobile at Barber Mandrell show. And he said, I'm heading back up to Tennessee. And the guy said, oh, I like Barbara Mandrell. I like her music. And he said, uh, he said, that's a long way to drive to go to the show. He said, well, I was... I was part of the show, and he talked back and forth, and he said, oh, are you, are you like sound man or something like that? And he said, uh, no, I'm one of the musicians, and he talked back and forth again for a bit, and then finally he said, uh, oh, well, well, what do you play? He said, well, I play the guitar. He said, and the man's name was Chet, and it was Chet Atkins, and he was one of the most famous guitar players of that day. And here he, this man was talking to Chet Atkins, and he didn't let on who he was. He was just being a regular guy. Let me ask you, have you are you a regular guy to people? Are you just a regular person? Are you trying to be something that you're not, or are you just a regular person? Right? I mean, could you come in if you was a millionaire and people wouldn't know that you had a lot of money? Or, or do you like to show it off? Consequently, spiritually, if you're a millionaire and you act like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a man of God. You don't have to tell people you're a man of God. That's right. You don't have to tell them what a woman of God you are. You don't have to tell them all that stuff. Your life, that's what this says. One, by the conversation of the wives, that means their behavior. Right? The husbands are one by the conversation of their wives. Your behavior wins them over. That's right. Your behavior will win people over. It will reach people like never before if you've not had meekness in your life. Let's make sure that meekness is one of the fruit of the Spirit that you have active in your life. And let's close in prayer. Father, I ask that you help us to have a meek and quiet spirit, to have the meekness of Christ about us, that whether we be of prominence or not in this world, that we will always remember who we are in Christ, that we have a servant's heart. Help us, Lord, to have a meek, spirit about us like never before lord help that meekness to shine forth in our lives that we don't have to be bold with people we can be quiet we can answer them if we need to but let the lord do our battles for us and i just thank you lord for what the word has shown us this morning help us all to put on meekness in jesus name amen, amen.